morning. We're so excited that everybody's here. If you're watching with us online, we're excited that you've tuned in and decided to spend part of your week with us. Um, so today we have several announcements and important dates that we want to put in front of you. So everybody take a minute, get out your iPhone calendar or your planner or your post-it notes, however you keep up with what you have going on, because we've got some stuff coming up that we want to make sure that you don't miss. The first event is next Sunday right after church. We're going to have Start C1. So if you have questions, you're curious about anything, this is your opportunity to find out information, get to know us a little better, um, and get a free meal out of it. Also, if you haven't filled out a Connect card in a while, you're new, you've moved, you've changed phone numbers, please be sure to fill one out. That way we can make sure that we can get in touch with you about anything that's coming up or any of the events or opportunities that you want to sign up for. We want to make sure we can get you the information. So if you're in person, the Connect cards are in the seats in front of you. If you're watching with us online or you'd rather fill it out on your phone, you can fill them out on our website at c1.church. Also, we want to just um, give you guys an amazing update with our Finish Strong campaign. And um, thank you guys so much for continuing to give and being faithful. We Last time we updated you, we were at about 46000 And this time we're at 43000 And so we are, we are pushing. We are chugging along. Yeah, give God the glory. And... And uh, we are just so pumped because we, we are like right there and, and we're just on the, on the cusp of something that is going to just free us up to, to um, do many, many things. And, so, and we're still doing many things. We're not letting debt stop us from giving and things like that. And so we just want to say thank you so much for continuing to give to our Finish Strong. And um, if you are, are all with us online, if you would like to give, there is a way to give online. And we do through texting and we do through um, personal. There are giving boxes in the back. But um, we are so thankful. Thank you guys for continuing to be faithful. We know that God is going to do this. And we know he's going to use his people to do it. And we also know that we're going to celebrate big time when this is all done. Because this is a huge, huge thing. And so um, I think Ryan told me this morning that from January, we were at 77,000 and now we're at 43,000. And so that's just this year. That is just this year. And so that's an, an amazing thing. So um, thank you. And God's going to, God will bless you. And he is already blessing the church. So um, continue to give and uh, thank you again. Absolutely. And the second date that I want to put in front of you is August the 22nd. So this is going to be where we have um, our introduction to this session's life group. So this is where you can hear from the leaders what they're going to have, what days and times, and this is your opportunity to sign up. So this will be when you have the leaders giving you information, and then after service we'll have our tables where you can find out more, get some more information about the one or two groups that you're interested in, and that's your chance to sign up. So that'll be August the 22nd, and then the following week, the week of August the 29th, will be the start of this life group session. So we're excited about that. Um, we're excited to have life groups back. We're going to be able to get two sessions in this year. That's the plan. Um, we weren't able to last year, but we're excited to get back to having our life groups two sessions each year. So August the 22nd, that's your opportunity to sign up. And we at, uh, here at our church, we, we, um, we have a few things that we try to, to live by and to share our story, live in community, and, um, and, and celebrate Jesus. And so one of the ways that we do that through life groups is we live in community. And let me tell you guys, life groups is so, so important because we've, just, we've been able to see the connection over this last summer of our life group still going strong and people hanging out even when we're not having life groups. And so um, it is such an important thing to be able to share your life with each other. And so please make sure to get signed up, get plugged in, because that's we, we believe in it so, so much because we believe that life is lived in circles and not rows. And I can tell you how I can, like, sometimes I'm sitting in life group and I'm like, what? They, I can't believe, you know, like I found out that some of our, our, um, 
people in our church have been to like six continents. And I'm like, what? How is that even possible? Like, I, did, I couldn't believe that. Like, it's so cool, just little details that you get to share in people's lives and, um, and be a part of their life. And so that's why we love it. That's why we, we hit on it so much. And so we're going to pray, and we're going to invite the Lord to be here. He's already here, but we're going to just um, continue to invite him, and he's going to speak to us, and it's going to be an awesome Sunday. God, we thank you that that you are here. Lord, we thank you that your presence is here, God. And, and Lord, no matter what this week has brought, whether it's brought amazing news or whether it's brought the saddest of news, God, we know that you are still in control. God, we know that, that you are the God of promises, that you are faithful, that you are have hold all things in your hands, God. And no matter what be what may be going around us, Lord, your church is the rock, and upon this rock you will build your church, God. And so we thank you that you have given us that promise. We thank you that we can go into today that no matter what is going on in our lives, that we can raise our hands and we can surrender to you and we can open up our, our heart to the word that you have for us today, Lord. I pray right now that each and every person their heart becomes tender to what you want for them. God, that their heart becomes tender towards, towards your word and towards what you are speaking to us today. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for being here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you'd like to stand, if you'd like to sit, we're going to celebrate Jesus. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves at 99, and I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never ending Reckless love of God I was your fault, steal your love off from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found leaves in 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. Yeah. 
shadow you won't light up a mountain you won't climb up coming after me the wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me no shadow you won't light up a mountain you won't climb up coming after me the wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Shadow, a shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. The wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, a mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me, thank you, Lord. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, and I couldn't earn don't deserve it still you give yourself away all the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God in stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone you believe that today? You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you'll provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, you're perfect in all your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Oh, you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to Can hardly speak peace so 
unexplainable lie I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love, love You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am it's who I am, you are, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, we worship you, Lord, you're perfect in all of your ways. Oh, you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. From your heart to his, can we sing that chorus? You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. who I am, it's who I am, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. on top of grace more than I've asked for more than I'm worth grace on top of grace how sweet the sound once lost now found heaven came down grace rescued me and hallelujah I am from my sin and penalty at the cross you took my place with your grace on top of grace Lord how you love me I deserve grace on top of grace more than I've asked for, more than I'm worth, grace on top of grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah, I am free from my sin and penalty. At the cross you took my place, with your grace on top of grace, with your grace on top of grace. lost now found heaven 
came down and grace rescued me how sweet the sound once lost now found heaven oh it came down grace rescued me hallelujah i am free from my sin and penalty at the cross you took my place with your grace on top of grace hallelujah i am free from my sin and penalty at the cross you took my place with your grace on top of grace oh with your grace on top of grace with your grace on top of grace how awesome is it that we have a god that saved us when we're so broken so lost that we have nothing else to do nobody is looking for us sometimes but we have a god that come down and give us the grace and saved us he is the one looking for us every day there is not a moment that passes that god has not and is not looking for you and that does not matter if it's us it's sitting here in this room or for outside these walls god loves everybody and he loves us and he wants us to know him and he shed that grace to us when we no longer and nobody else has that grace nobody has the authority to give us that grace we don't have the authority to give ourselves that grace but god does we have an amazing amazing father that has done that for us every day and he continues to do that for us no matter how bad your week has been no matter how hard your life has been no matter your situation no matter where you were raised no matter who you are and what you've done you've not too far gone god shed that grace for you and he is and will be that saving grace for all of eternity until we get our eternal reward in heaven and that's our goal it's not it's not about me it's about you it's about them it's about everybody who doesn't know god yet and at least and the least thing we can do is shed that grace that god's given us to shed to other people so god thank you so much for being here today god thank you for allowing this broken man to be able to speak today god thank you for allowing us to be yours. Thank you for giving us this grace, God. You are an amazing, amazing Father. God, I love you so much, and I, I pray that you, you anoint this word, God, that you, uh, that you don't, that Nathan's not speaking today. It's not me, that you speak through me. Use my words. Use a man who's not good at speaking, doesn't really enjoy speaking sometimes, to speak a word that you have for us today. God, I praise you, and I praise your name. Amen. So how are y'all doing today? You know, talking about that, it's been, it's been a heck of a week for me. You know, trying to, trying to write a sermon around work and everything that's going crazy right now. Also, we're building a house, too. So, work, house, sermon. It's been a lot this week. And then when everything I thought could go, go, go wrong, couldn't go wrong no more, it did. I spent uh, like Thursday and Friday night at work until about 8, 8, 8, 8.30. Didn't get home before 9.30 or so each night. You know, trying to polish off, I mean, I got my, I got my sermon going, I'm like, yeah, it's, go, it's rolling good, I'm in a place where it's, it's really kind of, it's clicking, I'm, I'm, I'm having a flow, and it's like the brakes hit me, couldn't do it, because I just didn't have the time, I physically couldn't do it, I was physically, I was at work, by the time I got home, I was so exhausted, I was all I could do to crawl into the shower for a few minutes, and then, and then eat dinner, and you know, just basically pass out and do it all again the next day. Like Friday, it come it come to a head. This is kind of how amazing God God is too. It come to a head Friday. We were well, what the whole deal is. We had um, where I work. If you don't know me, I'm an enge- I'm an engineer. Uh, we have, we have a bunch of prototype parts right now. We're in a season where we have a bunch of new projects coming into our plant. We have uh, 400 prototype parts that was due on a truck um, Friday evening. The truck luckily got canceled, so I, we were able to pack them out Monday. So it would be good to go then. But Friday come to it, we got. Half of them done on Thursday, and then the tooling that we're supposed to be able to, to run the last 200 round wouldn't work. Nothing would work. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew how to do it. Nothing, nothing was going. Friday, we spent all day. It was 6 o'clock. We still had 200 parts to go Friday. 
it come to it, me and my coworker, we're sitting there, we're, we're, we're working this, me. It come to the point, we're starting to modify the equipment to try to force it to run. That is a, that is a big deal. I mean, we're, try, we're modifying equipment that runs other things to see, just try to do something different. We've, we, it didn't work. <laughs> we put it back together. He, he looks at me, he's mad. He goes, I'm ready to throw stuff, Nathan. I'm done. I'm ready to throw it. I'm done. I can't do it. We're done. We're done. We're out of ideas. He goes, do you have anything you can think of? I said, dude, all we can do is pray for it. <laughs> at this point, all we can do is pray. It can't hurt. By God, we laid hands on a machine and prayed for it, and we took a 15-minute break outside, sat down, and we just, uh, and we ended up forcing, I just thought about it, and we, we were kind of talking, spitballing things to do back and forth, and um, we have a similar product that runs on a different line. We took the tooling for it. Uh, you know, let's just see if we can force it to run with that. By God, it worked. <laughs> By 7.45, we were finishing up, and we were cleaning up. I mean, so what we fought with from about 7 that morning to about 6 o'clock <laughs> was resolved after a quick prayer. I mean, I wish I'd have done that about, you know, <laughs> a lot earlier. Maybe God was doing, doing a little work on me that day, but, you know, that's how it goes. Um, so that's kind of how my week went. But, you know, I'm glad to be here, guys. We're going to be reading out of Jonah 3 today. And uh, if you want to go ahead and put that up there, we'll, we'll go ahead and hit that. Um, so, Jonah 3.1, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message that I've given you. This is like right after Jonah just kind of got yacked up on shore right down the road from Nineveh. I mean, this man spent like a, spent like a glory cruise in a fish. I mean, he was happy. I'm sure he was happy. Honestly, I'm sure he was really happy at this point. He's out of the, he's out of the fish. <laughs> the, okay, um, it says, sorry, verse 3 now. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he, sh- he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least of them, they declared a fast, put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from from his throne, took off his royal robes and garments. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent, sent a decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds nor flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop their violence. Who can tell, perhaps, even God, yet, even God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how he, they had put a, a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. All right. So, a first point, we're going to throw up the first point. It's, uh, it's God delivers news, right? Honestly, by show of hands, was this good news or bad news to you if you heard this? God's going, you got 40 days, God's going to destroy you, you're done. That's it. I mean, the Bible, honestly, Jonah may have said more than those eight words. He probably did walking around. He spent three days walking around the city. But does that really sound like good news to you? No, that's, that's not good news at all. So before we, before we really dive deep into that part, let's, let's take a look at Nineveh for a second and see kind of what Nineveh is. Um, Nineveh was the, was the crown jewel of the Assyrian Empire at the time. Nineveh is this massive city. It's beautiful. It has everything you could, you could ever imagine. It has monuments everywhere. It has two walls defending it. One, the inner wall of the two is 50 foot wide. They didn't, they didn't really care what you had to say. They, they, were, they were protecting themselves. They had no threat really to them. They were the, like one of the premier cities of the days. You, you weren't going to do anything. So they, there's kind of a, just a little, a little bit about them. I mean, it's it an amazing city. I mean, there's writings about how beautiful it was. But there's also the other side of that, how lawless and, and cruel they are. Um, the, the prophet Nahum, and, and, and I said this ain't in there, but Nahum uh, 3.1, if you want to check it, it says, uh, Nahum wrote, What sorrow awaits the city of Nineveh, the, sit, the city of murder and lies. She is crammed with wealth and is never, about, is never without victims. 
That sounds like an amazing city. Sounds like a place I want to go visit. Let's go ahead and book a trip now, guys. Go. But the thing is, it was a city of great need and great temptation. A city of horrible crimes and horrible, horrible affliction. I mean, the kings, they're writing from kings in Nineveh. We're talking about literally destroying villages and, and painting the mountainsides of blood. Flaying the other king and putting its skin on the wall. Stacking up their warriors' heads as a, as a pillar, as a monument to how they will never be defeated. They were arrogant. There are other kings at Nineveh that wrote, that wrote uh, basically how great they were. How great they were as a person. How they were just the, the god of their, of their day, basically, if, you, if, you read that, if they read that writing. So that, on top of that, they're, they're not only ruthless, violent, full, full of all kinds of sin, threats, they have a supreme arrogance about them, too. If you ever know, met arrogant people, they typically don't like being wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not a thing. I, I don't like being wrong, but when you get people like that, they, they're not really good at saying, hey, 40 days you're going to die. Like, <laughs> you see about that, you're going to die on this wall later. Um, but they also worship a god named Ninu, which is a fish god. So I'm setting this up just a little bit. Um, Ninu was a fish god that, that they worshipped. Actually, uh, Nineveh at that time was pronounced uh, Ninua. Ninua was, is this, the, the city of the fish god, basically, is what it translates to, roughly. Um, to be honest, we don't think about the entrance Jonah made to Nineveh that much. I mean, he... He and himself was being corrected from a from a wrong. God was kind of trying to try to turn him to. He he's a prophet that was given a message to deliver to a city who had lost. And then in that, Jonah had lost his uh, lost his way a little bit, right? He lost his love for people. If he loved people like like he should have loved people that time, at, at the first command, he would have went to Nineveh, regardless of the consequence. So God had to do some work in Jonah first. And oftentimes we're, we're a lot like that. God has to do some work on us to, get us to get us to go. But it shows God's mercy also on that. But so the entrance Jonah makes, he's in a, in a fish. I mean, let's be, let's be realistic here. He wasn't on a lounge chair sitting in the fish's belly like sometimes you, watch, you see on like some of the kids' shows and stuff. about. It. You see Jonah kind of propped up against the rib, you know, you know just, just sipping on a cup of water. No. He's in a stomach. I mean, he's probably crammed tight. I mean, just like he's in a tube, getting beat up, everything else. Comes out hurting, black and blue, sore. Like Ryan may have mentioned the other week, bleached white from the acids in the, in the fish's stomach is what they believed. Could you imagine? He's probably a sight for sore eyes and really a, like an affliction on your nasal cavity at that point in time. <laughs> so the last thing you really want to see is this man. But for them, they're a city that worships a fish god, and a fish yaks this guy up on the, on the shore and says, Hey, 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. You think there's a little bit of significance there? The irony is, is, is too good to be true. So Jonah was, had to be corrected a little bit, had to have his, had to have, be kind of reset, and his, his mind realigned and his, and his focus realigned with God. Which happened in the belly of uh, in the belly of the fish, but his entrance to, right there it says, it says it all. God, God was paving the way, even when even when Jonah wasn't ready to go, he's paving the way for his word to go forth. So, to be honest, like really, why is it looking at Nineveh so so significant? Because it really makes you understand like that how lost they were. They're a city that there's really no hope for. Looking on the outside, if you really had nothing else, nothing else about you, there's really not, not a lot of hope there. They're violent. They're horrible. Just, just, you don't want to go there. They're the sin city of their day. Everything and anything you can do is there. And um, you know what? God loved them too. God wants to deliver them from destruction. So Jonah being Jonah, he's been, he, at this point in time, like I said, he, he's, he's, he's spit up on shore right there. 
He's probably still not happy about having to go. He probably still don't want to go. He's going this time because God's correcting him. But, he, but I imagine him being kind of like a little bit of a toddler in this, in this point. He's, he, but he calms down as he's going. I don't really want to go to Nineveh, but I'll go this time. I don't want to be in the stinking fish. Ah, not doing that again. Ah, but I'll preach it. And then as he's getting closer to the gates, he's calmed down. Yeah, these people need me. These people need what God has to say. But how often, like, God has to push us. And it doesn't matter how it looked when we started the journey. It's how the journey ended, really. So Jonah being, and nobody can really blame Jonah for running at the beginning if you, if you look, by looking at the city, but how brutal they were. Because his pr- first thought was, they're going to kill me. I'm going to th- tell them they're going to die so they have nothing to lose. They're just going to kill me anyway. Eh. That's what happened. So... He ran to save himself, but God had, had bigger plans for the city. Likely, I mean, honestly, how many of us get told, like if we're at work, they get told, hey, I need you to tell this, go down here and inform these people of this. Usually it's bad news when your boss comes and says, hey, I need you to inform you of this, because they're going to take the good news for themselves. <laughs> Usually I have to be the bearer of bad news a lot. <laughs> hey, um, shut it down. <laughs> It ain't going to work. And it, it, people might get angry about it. Like, hey, I'm just telling you what I'm told to tell you. But the thing is, we often mix up be, delivering bad news for, um, for, de- for damnation. Sometimes bad news isn't bad to the person you're telling. They just don't know any different. The, what we perceive as bad news and what we perceive as, as damnation for somebody is somebody... Is somebody getting a light shined out of them going, this is an opportunity for me to change. And if you grew up doing something or you were raised in a, in a scenario and you've never seen otherwise or you like here in Nineveh, this is all you know what they do. Bad news to Jonah is just news, was just news to them. Okay, it might be bad that he has 40 days the city is going to be destroyed, but... Would they have rather just, would, would you rather know, had, no, hey, 40 days, either we've got to try something or you're out. There's some mercy there, a lot of mercy there. We, we, we just don't, we don't think about it that way a lot of times. On top of being the bearer, the bearer of bad news, many of us hate hearing bad news, so we, we're unreceptive to the, to the news. We choose to, we choose to shut it down, you know. I don't want to hear that, so no news, bad news, don't even tell me, no news is good news, until, you know, poof, you're, done, you're gone right here in this scenario, honestly, I don't know what, what would have happened, I'm not, I'm not God, I can't tell you that if Jonah didn't go the second time, that God wouldn't have destroyed the city anyway, or if that, or he would have sent somebody else, I hope he would have sent somebody else, but I don't know, I'm not God, I can't, t- I can't tell you these things, but I tell you, as Christians, we often refrain from telling people bad news, or telling people things that, that, uh, that we feel like that God is leading us to say because it might offend somebody or hurt their feelings or because they might, you know, not, not like it. But sometimes the bad news that we feel that God gives us to, give, to tell somebody is honestly a chance for them to, is, is God shining a light on something that they need. And there's a difference in delivering bad news with, a, with like kind of like malice in your heart on it. People, yeah, we always need, know these people, people that are just overjoyed to say, you're going to lose your job. And then you have other people like, hey, man, I hate to do this. Your job's going away, but we've found, and your job's going away. We're going to have to lay you off. But next week, we're launching this new work, this new project, and we've got a place for you. There's a, di- there's a difference in, in the tone. There's a difference in the heart. Bad news sometimes isn't fun to give, and it's not easy to give, but when we give it with, out, of a, out of a heart of malice, we're just, as bad as the, we're just as bad as what we're trying to tell them that they're doing. But when you tell somebody something over, and, and with, with a pure heart and, and heart with, a, with pure intention on that, God has a way of working it out. God will go before you with that bad news and lay the groundwork for the, the reception of the news. Just like a cancer diagnosis. You may not want to hear the diagnosis, but sometimes if you, if you didn't have the, the news of the diagnosis, you would have never known it was, op- it would, it was operable.
So, but Jonah was asked to present the, the news that God gave him. Just, just like we're tasked with sharing good news. We have the good news of, we have the good news that God gave us. We have a Lord and Savior that died for our sins and covered us and covered everything that, we, that we've ever done. All we have to do is repent of our sins and turn to Jesus. That is pretty dang good news that no matter how bad you've been, how, how hard your life has been, we have a Savior that loves us so much. That he did it, did it. That is that is the great commission that that we were tasked with. So, I'm not saying that's the only news we may be given from the Lord to get, to give, but it may be the only news you ever you ever have to give. Hey, you have a, you, we have a God that loves you. He had a son that, that he sent to Earth and died for you. And if we don't, and if we don't ever give it, we're just as bad as not giving the bad news. It's because often we we just, we just don't want to tell people because we. We're scared of, of their reaction with it. But oftentimes, the lost people that we're scared of and scared of their reaction, they're the most likely to listen to us. The lost people tend to be the most receptive people because they're looking for somebody to find them. And the ones that don't know they're lost don't know, don't, aren't looking for somebody, and they're, and they're the most least receptive sometimes. So that's really, that's really where it's at. So I'm going to move, move on to the, to the next point real quick. It's, uh, it's God delivers authority. So, there was authority on Jonah's words here, right? It wasn't Jonah's authority. Jonah's authority was, is, was horrible. I mean, let's be realistic. We don't have, what was his authority? What is his authority going to do? You're going to die. Jonah has no power to kill an entire city by himself, blow up a city, wipe it off the earth. Nothing. There's nothing he could have done. There's no authority behind his words. But when God's authority is behind the words, it's different. God's, God's news or word never falls on deaf ears. Somebody will listen. Even if you're talking to, if you're talking to a room with 100 people, a room with one person, or a city, there may be somebody that listens. One person is, is worth, if God's word reaches one person, that's, that's all that matters. That's really all that matters. And the thing, upon here. And the thing is, that this is this news wasn't great. Obviously, it's gonna be destroyed. But upon hearing the news, the people of Nineveh, you know, did the surprising thing that Jonah probably thought an issue that they, that they that they were gonna kill him over. They repented and and just made, yeah, we don't want to die, and turned around and went to God. But the thing is, it shows how with with the city of that of that history in that. And that mindset that a statement with God's authority placed behind it stands strong and that God places it in, in, in where it needs to be. They heard exactly what they needed. It didn't take an eloquent speech. It didn't take, uh, it didn't take a sermon of all sermons. It didn't, take, it didn't take anything. It took, hey, basically eight words. Eight words that would have, that would have made any, anybody potentially, you couldn't have blamed them if they just sank down when they heard that. It made, it made them hopeful and change. So honestly, what are the things that we place our authority, place authority in that, uh, that you know, can kind of block God's authority on this stuff? And the thing is, God's not going to battle us over it. We get to choose God's authority. We get to choose to submit to God and submit our authority to God's authority because God's authority is greater than ours and he allows us, and he allows us, he allows us our free will, but he wants us, but he puts power behind us what we're doing if we're doing it in God's name. So oftentimes we put way too much authority in ourselves. I mean, so often we hear, you know, it's all about me, myself, and I. I don't need anybody else. I'm good. You know what? I know myself. I suck sometimes. I really do. I'm not a great person sometimes. I mean, I don't care. I don't care. I've, I've done stupid things. I'm probably still going to do stupid things, I, but I'm also human. And I'm fully human, and I understand that. And thank God I have a God that, is, that his son died for me and allowed, for, and allowed me the grace that he, that he has. But if I only have authority in myself, then it's hollow and ultimately weak and there's, there's nothing really there. I have no power to change a man's heart. I have no power to touch a man's, to touch a man or a man's illness or a woman's illness. I have no 
I have no, no nothing. I, I can't get you to your eternal reward. All I can get you is eternal damnation. God's authority can, can change the eternal damnation that, we're all, that we all justly deserve because we're born sinners. We're in sinful bodies. We desire sin. God's word and God's authority is the only thing that can change that. And a man speaking with God's authority can move mountains. But a man speaking in his own authority can't even open that door. The next thing we, we place authority in, we, and, I, and I word it this way, just cut, to cut, tie it with the city of Nineveh more or less, authority in like false gods. What do we place in our life that is more, more authority than sometimes we give God? Sometimes we give God, our, God authority at different times of day, then we close them off, and then we open up Facebook. And you know, if what Facebook says go, everything's on Facebook is true. <laughs> I, I mean, come on now, right? We place a lot of authority in that stuff. And what people say on Facebook and what somebody shared from, from somebody else that shared it from somebody else and then shared it from somebody else that, honestly, we don't really know where it came from. We place a lot of authority in that stuff. And we, tell, and we tell it to other people like it's true. Why can't we tell something about Jesus instead? Why can't we do, any, do that? Honestly, it's not, we, we can. It's easy. We place a lot of authority in our jobs. People are, I know, and I'm not saying that we should quit. I'm not saying quit your jobs. We don't need money. We don't need to live. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, is you see people that are completely absorbed with their work. That's all they do. That's all they think. That's all that, that, that has become essentially their God because their whole life revolves around this job and anything outside of it no longer exists or matters to them. Gaming is another thing. I mean, it, it, I'm throwing that, you can list it for days how many things that we place authority in that we don't, that we ain't. That's not, uh, that's not it. And I say false God. I'm not saying we worship it and pray to it. We're not praying toward, to Call of Duty. I mean, we're not praying in the name of Call of Duty. We're not praying in the name of Facebook. I'm not saying that. But we place that, that authority in those objects and those things in past times in order to, in, in order to cover something. And so we, and we really got to dig, dig past that. The other thing we place authority in tends to be other people, what other people, ha what other people have. Too often, we place God-like authority in men and women, just like, our, just like national leadership. Or like that. I'm not saying that they don't have authority, that we place them in positions of authority we, when we elected them. But the, the, thing, the thing is, they do not have greater authority than God. They never will. So we also have to categorize, understand that there is a, there's a hierarchy in the authorities that we, that we follow and we place, th uh, place our authority in and submit our authority to. And we submit so much to, to it. Ultimately, God's authority is where we, is where we really kind of, we, we need to place that as number one. Because again, I could place my authority in, in, in the Ryan right here. But Ryan's authority is, is hollow without God's authority behind it. And I believe Ryan has God's authority behind him when he, when he asks me to do things. And I'm thankful for that. But ultimately, my, me, an object, or another man has no authority in saving somebody, and saving somebody's soul. Which is, which, is, which is amazing because when we submit all of our authority to God, we then can move forward with, that abil with the, a true authority to do that. But here in Nineveh's case, let's look at the king for just a second. We have a, a guy that is on the throne. I mean, he has full authority to do whatever he feels like in the city. Hands down, you cannot question it. Whatever, he, whatever his edict he passes is, you've got to do it. There's no, there's, no, there's no changing it unless you kill him and take over, and then you're the king and do the, and do the same thing as well. But he's also a man. But the thing is, the word that he heard which didn't even, didn't even sound that great, had, had such power in God's name behind it that he removed his royal garments. How many times have we seen a, a, a national leader, a king, a president or something, strip down their garments and place burlap sackcloth on and sit in a heap of ashes and submit his complete authority? I mean, he, 
He's sitting, he's, he's sitting on a heap of ashes. Complete authority given up to God. He'd give it all to God at that point in time. Because he knew there was no hope in the other ways. Any other ways. Submitting our, of course, our posture of, of submission is different. Everybody, it changes. You don't always have to be sitting on a heap of ashes when burlap cloth because that would be very uncomfortable and itchy. <laughs> Thank God we don't have to do, we don't do that as much. <laughs> but he submitted his throne to God that he was right, that it was rightfully his. He stepped off of his throne. He, th- he stepped away from his fine jewels. He stepped away from his fine garments. And gave, it, and gave all of his authority to God in that moment. If anything, most of the time you don't see kings do that. You see kings in this, like in, like in Nineveh here, you, you see kings crave more power and then they conquer to achieve more power. And can't get, and really can't, don't get anything else out of it, out of that. Ultimately, this submission, and this in this submission, he didn't only to do it himself, but he used his uh, his position of authority after he submitted his authority to declare to declare a, a decree for the nation or for for the city at the time that all people, man, woman, even the beast of the fields the flocks submit before God. You know, what, what was this decree for? Was it a promise? Was it a, was it a guarantee or what? I, mean, I can tell you, no, it wasn't a promise. They didn't know if God would change his mind. It wasn't a guarantee. No, because, you know, it wasn't, hey, 40 days from now, you're going to be destroyed unless you do this. There was no unless in the statement. It was simply, this is what's going to happen. But if, when we look back at verse 9, it it was, it was based off of a chance and, a, and some hope. It was, who can tell perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger against us. They did it based off of a chance that God would change his mind. Not even, had, not even a guarantee, but a chance. All they had was a little hope and a little faith, and they did it and they acted on it. And a little word. They didn't have an in-depth knowledge of the scripture. They, didn't have, they don't have a Bible that they can carry around. They don't have a Bible they can carry around on this device and pull up anything. Uh, we, can't, we take for granted that we have a cell phone, that we have constant access to the internet also. We can pull up not only our Bible, we can pull up in, all kinds of reference, all kinds of references, biblical stories. We can listen to podcasts, preaching, anything from a device like this. We have more access to good news and with good news and the word of God than ever. They didn't have that. They had eight words. And, all, and it wasn't even a hopeful words. It was, you're going to be destroyed. Well, we could hear everything. But they, 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 they changed. They, they, they acted on it. The third point I have on in this, and it's going to tie it all together, is God delivers us. So the story, the story in the Bible really goes to show you that, that we don't need the fancy walls. We don't need the fancy church buildings. We don't need the fancy speakers. We don't need years and years of practice and years and years of study to save somebody. We just need to have a word from God and God's authority behind us when we, when we deliver that word. People of Nineveh, like I said, needed eight words, essentially. To be honest... Jonah's message may have contained, contained more, of eight, more than eight words. Like I said before, it was a very large city, and he was, was decree, decreeing this as he walked throughout the city. It took him three days to walk through the city. But, and it wasn't an easy, an easy message to hear. Probably wasn't an easy message to give, but it had God's power behind it. But if, if the Bible did this, you think, you think, you think about this, it's, it probably summarized it from what it was to eight words to show a point. There was, no, there was nothing great in, in it. The point was God's power moves before his word. When he gives you a word to give, his power moves out, open, opens the hearts, opens the ears, and allows, and allows for its reception. And if we, didn't, if we don't deliver that, then we wasted it. 
It's not about who, it's not about the words themselves. It's not about the man that's delivering the words, but it's about the, the authority that come behind the words and open the heart to see, to see the message behind the words that there's a chance if we change our ways now. There is a chance. God doesn't, God doesn't, it's like us, I mean, we, we don't, it's like, to be honest, I'm going to tell you a funny thing real quick. It's like dad with a snake. My, my dad, if you, ever, if you know him, he hates snakes. We don't cast judgment. Dad doesn't, dad doesn't cast judgment on the snake and go, you got three minutes to get, up, get away or I'm going to kill you. Nope. He grabs the shovel in his hand. If he's digging the hole and there's a snake coming by. <laughs> it's dead. It's done. There's no chance, no hope, no nothing. It didn't, the snake didn't have an opportunity to move out of the way. And find out it was a lizard. <laughs> well, poor lizard didn't have a chance either because he thought it was a snake. Look, look too similar. <laughs> but I say this because God announces his judgment because he doesn't want to punish us. He wants to give us the opportunity to change. Unlike us, we're, we're, so, we're so quick to... If I said us here in this room, I mean, it, people in general, we're quick to cast judgment on people and go... And when we cast that judgment, we just expect the punishment to follow. We don't do anything about it. But God, God announces his judgment, like the, in this case, to avoid the punishment. Because ultimately that punishment would have ended the lives of thousands of people. And they, and, they wouldn't, and they wouldn't have eternal glory in heaven. Instead, Jonah's, right here, Jonah, what could have been Jonah's worst mistake turned into his greatest victory in ministry. Ben, if you want to come on up. Um, see, with that, the, power, the power that stands behind those words is the power that moves mountains, and in this case, it's an entire city that moved. They, from the greatest to the least of them, they placed sackcloth on, they sat in ashes, they did everything they did that showed. And the point of putting the burlap on and sitting in the ashes and all that was, in that day, it was a sign of complete surrender and complete distress. They... There's nothing else to do. It was a sign of full mourning. But not only did they do that, they placed burlap on the animals. Can you imagine putting a burlap cloth shirt on a donkey? I just watched, I just imagined somebody getting kicked. I mean, or chase a chicken around to put some burlap on a chicken. How are you going to do that? That sounds horrible. <laughs> but they did it. I mean, it, it, what, what sounds silly to us when you really think about it, I mean, it probably was a comedy show going on when they're trying to get the burlap on all these animals. But it, it was an act of surrender. I mean, it was work for them to do that. But, they, but, it was, but in that work, they surrendered everything they had to God. You know, God tasked Jonah, Jonah delivered the judgment to his people, not mock, and not mock his people, but rather it was a warning. And, and you know, and the, people, and the people changed miraculously. God had moved before him with his authority and his... Uh, and, and his power and his word changed their hearts. They listened. The whole city was saved. But it's also an opportunity, and just like this, it's an opportunity for us to submit before the Lord, either in delivery or, or reception of, a, of news. Often we cast it away. But we, when we submit before the Lord on that, either way, God had, to, God had two challenges here with Jonah. Jonah wasn't submitting to deliver the news at first until he had, until he had to do a little correction with the fish. The city n- needed to receive the news, and God moved forward and, and, and did both. So both need, needed to happen. We, we, have, we have a city here in Columbia, Tennessee. We have a nation, and there's a, and there's a world full of people that need to hear the good news. And we have it right here in the Bible. So you don't even have to pull it up. I mean, you don't even have to, have to like memorize it. We can simply pull it up. Or we can just simply say, God loves you. Inv- or we can invite them to something. Invite them to church. Invite them to an event. Hang out with them. Be the example that they, that they need. And the thing is, when we go out and we, with pure intention not to glorify ourselves, but to glorify God's name and to reach somebody, it never falls on deaf ears. They might not show up in this church building. They might not show up in that church building. But they might show up in some, somewhere else. And you don't know what happens between here and there. And if they may have got saved in a bathroom in a Chick-fil-A somewhere. God saves people in crazy places all the time. We just have to, if we give them that hope and give them that faith, 
God can do it. Just like here, God saved what really is a crazy city in the craziest way by a guy who was spit up by a fish. I mean, that's ironic in his own. I mean, he and it didn't say, say he showered first. He went immediately to the city. I mean, so he's walking around for three days stinking like a fish gut. And, he's, and the city listened to him. So the craziest thing you can think of, that won't, that, and you think, oh, it will never happen. It will. It can. God wants to do the crazy. He wants to do the abnormal. He wants us to be what he has for us to be. And it's not even anything crazy. It's just, hey, God loves you. You know Jesus. And we, we, we make it complicated. So, honestly, I'm, I'm, it's really where, where I've got where right here today. But I think, honestly, God... God has a lot going. But honestly, what is our Nineveh to us? And this, to pull it out, what is Nineveh to us? God, God, there's places of great need in, in the world. There's places of great need around us. There are people with great need around us. What can we do? And I just want to we'll take a minute and, we just, and pray about it. But I think, I think that, that's, that's what God really wants us to do. How can we be used? I'm not saying everybody has to be a missionary. I'm not saying everybody has to be a pastor. I'm not saying everybody has to. You can simply have your job. You can simply be the Christian God asks you to be, a God-loving, God-fearing person and save somebody and simply in God's name or by, by a simple introduction. You don't, you're not even doing the saving. God's doing the saving. You're just introducing that work. That work comes with you, comes with you, comes behind the introduction. If uh, let's take a minute. Let's just bow our heads and just pray. We'll see where God really has us. But I feel like God's really wanting, wanting me to do right now. All of us.
God, thank you so much for speaking to us today, Lord. Thank you for speaking a word directly from you and allowing us to hear it and I hear it in the translation, God. God, I pray that we heed your words and that we hope we were receptive to that, God. You are an amazing Father. Thank you for allowing me to speak and present, and present your word to, to our church today, God. And I praise your name, Lord. You are going to do amazing things, and you are an amazing God, and you will always be an amazing God. You will reach more people than you could ever imagine when we pray in God's name, in Jesus' name, Lord. God, you are an amazing Father. Thank you again for speaking to us today. Thank you so much for being here in the house today, God. I pray that this is spoken of outside of here, Lord. I pray that people see it, people hear it, people love it, God, that they know it's you. God, your word will never go fall on deaf ears. Your word will never fall on deaf ears, God. We love you so much, and thank you so much again, Lord. I pray for protection over our church. I pray for protection over the people that listen to this. I pray for protection over everybody who goes out in your name, Jesus, that your word reaches the ones you intended to reach, God, and it reaches everybody. Because your intention is for, every, for no person not to hear the name. You want everybody to hear your name, God. I praise you, Father, and thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, y'all have, have a great day. Thank you so much for letting me speak to y'all.